My name is Lisa McLean, and I'm a PhD candidate at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution and one of the editors of Counteract Magazine, Feminist Bridging Theory and Action. Cynthia Enloe is a visionary scholar in the field of feminist international relations and has published several highly influential books, including Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics, and Globalization and Militarism, Feminists Make the Link, both now in their second editions. Dr. Enloe has pushed the traditionally androcentric boundaries of international relations and the study of conflict by asking where are the women in our analyses of the global political and economic order, and by asserting that we must take women's lives and contributions seriously. In February 2017, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with Dr. Enloe about feminism in the age of Trump. We discussed the current global political order from a feminist perspective, the reimposition of the global gag rule under the Trump administration, suggestions for building femi feminist curiosity in the classroom, and Dr. Enloe's reflections on the 2017 Women's March on Washington. We hope you enjoy. I'm in a country that now is really in political turmoil. Um, not violent turmoil yet, although the detentions of so many um, documented and undocumented immigrants is a form of violence, no, no question about it. But it is, it is not turmoil necessarily at the barricades in the sense of having guns pointed at most of us, but most of us are in high political mode. We wake up thinking about the Trump administration's implications. We go to bed thinking about it. Most of us have given donations at a higher rate than we have in several years, even those of us who donate quite regularly. Most of us are on the phone to members of the House and the Senate more than we have been. Most of us are reading the newspaper. I'm a big New York Times reader, um, and I love the New York Times, and they've now increased the number of journalists they have in their Washington bureau. Mm -hmm. I read the Times carefully every day, um, but I now read it with pen in hand, even when I can't think what I'm going to do with the article, I feel as though I've got to understand, well, how does the National Security Council work? Now, you'd think I would know that, but it turns out I didn't know. I didn't know that there were 200 civil servants that work for the National Security Council of the United States government. Mm -hmm. Who knew? I didn't know. I should have known. So we're in high political mode. There are two things as a feminist I think I try to keep track of. Of course, I'm still trying to think about how the election, presidential election campaign went the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I try to say pretty frequently that um, Hillary Clinton uh, won the popular vote um, and that Donald Trump won lost the popular vote. And this really matters in the sense of not being overwhelmed with the thought that, you're, that a majority of your fellow citizens voted for somebody who seemed so reckless and so sexist and so racist. Mm -hmm. It is really important for me to say kind of every day to myself, not in a sanguine way, but in a kind of reality check way. Don't think the whole country, quote unquote, has gone right. Mm -hmm. It is enough people decided to overlook or forgive or silently but not openly support some of his more outrageous stands and to vote for him. That does matter, and it matters a lot. It also matters that the House and the Senate now have parties in majorities that, for their own reasons, their own self-serving reasons, have decided to overlook his racist and sexist um, views. So it is a it's a time of high political energy, but I this is the caveat I try to keep telling myself. Other countries are in high political alert. And we just in America think we're at the center of the political universe, but we're not. You know, you in Mexico, you know that Mexicans have been in a state of high political attention. Um, for decades, mm -hmm. and especially in the last 10 years, 
with the increasing militarization of the drug war. Um, but it's also true in Bangladesh, and it's true in Indonesia. And I'm not just picking those countries kind of off the top of my head. I mean, so it's really important, I think, and especially your readers and viewers will appreciate this because your readers and viewers are all over the world, not to become Americocentric, mm -hmm. as if Trump is more important than Putin. Mm -hmm. Or that Trump is more important than Erdogan. Or Trump is more important than Xi in China. These are also authoritarian leaders. They are also doing great damage to any kind of popular uh, accountability in their own countries. So as awful as Trump is, I, as sitting here in the U.S., I try really hard not to think that what's going on here is the most important thing in the world. Where is domestic violence in any government's um, thinking, aspiration, and actions? Where is it? And one of the, oh, the characteristics now of the Putin regime, the current Russian government, is the close alliance that Putin has developed with the Russian Orthodox Church hierarchy. That is one of the, the tripod of the, the Putin regime. It is Putin himself, the Russian Orthodox Church hierarchy. That doesn't mean everyone who goes to church. I mean, not the hierarchy of the clergy um, and the combined security forces. I mean, that are, those are the three legs of the current Russian government. And because the hierarchy of the very patriarchal um, Russian Orthodox Church is so um, dedicated to a certain kind of patriarchal family in which husbands rule the roost and their authority should not be challenged. It is very hard to have a public condemnation and holding of accountable those men in those families who physically abuse their women partners. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also true that in Turkey, it is increasingly difficult for Turkish feminists, of whom there are a lot. They were making real headways with judges, for instance, to get judges not to excuse uh, husbands of physically abusing their wives. And they really had worked to educate judges, to change the mind of judges. They had also managed to get the government civil service to take more seriously domestic violence in Turkey as a crime. They really had made progress during the 1990s and the early 2000s. Erdogan, who has a much more patriarchal view of what is not only a normal family, but a desirable family, has started to roll that back in Turkey. In the United States, as you know, um, and probably all your listeners are aware, that the domestic violence, anti-domestic violence efforts here have been going on since the 1970s, at least. Mm -hmm. um, the whole idea of wife, wife battering was the first term in the 1970s, and that term was first used by a British feminist activist. The sh shelter movement um, for women who are being abused in their households, uh, that begins in the 19, I think the first one in the United States was in San Diego in 1969, I think, I may be wrong on that, but it's really a 1970s, 80s movement, so it's not, Trump didn't introduce this, um, Erdogan didn't introduce it, um, that is domestic violence, um, nor did Putin, it's a long-standing new conceptualization of rights not stopping at the threshold of a household. Mm -hmm. That is, this, I mean, we all, you know, all of us who work so hard um, to understand uh, feminist theorizing, we know that the division between public and private is one of the keys to patriarchal systems. And that included that a man's house is his castle, which mm -hmm. really meant that women have no rights, they are not citizens once they step over the doorstep of their own house. 
they're a wife and a mother, they are not a citizen. Mm -hmm. And the really radical and important contributions of feminists everywhere is to say a woman never stops being a citizen. And I'm using citizen now, not in terms of your papers. I'm talking about you as invested with rights and invested with the capacity to take part in public affairs. That kind of, that's what I mean when I say citizenship. I'm using it much more broadly than passports. So what's going on now is, an, is a backlash against the successes, considerable successes, of efforts by feminists all around the world, including those who work inside the United Nations, to recognize domestic violence as a violation of rights. That's new, that's radical, because it says a woman is never reduced to being a wife. She's never, as important as mothering is, that's never all she is. She is a citizen. That's the most, one of the most radical things I think you can say about a woman. She is a citizen and she's always a citizen which means she has rights and she has capacities for public participation. So you're right to watch Putin and also uh, Trump um, try to roll back that understanding. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, they, he has the support of um, the patriarchal thing, the evangelical Protestant church and patriarchal clerics inside the Catholic Church, and probably Vice President Pence is the most patriarchal, very self-consciously patriarchal um, conceptualizer of the American family. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Two things about um, Trump's reimposition. I don't think he'd ever given a single thought to this. I think you're right. I think it's his alliance with um, Mike Pence, the vice president, who is much more consciously committed to anti-reproduction productive rights. He sees that as a violation of his notion of what a quote unquote Christian family should be. Mm -hmm. Second thing, though, and that so it's it's not very high on Trump's own personal agenda. It's because it's not high on it that people close to him can influence him on it. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is, and this is why it's really important that Americans pay, American feminists pay much more attention to feminists who work in international development and who work um, inside and lobby the United Nations. And that is that this global gag rule that has been imposed by um, the signature of a pen by new, newly inaugurated um, Donald Trump is broader. It's broader than the one imposed by George W. Bush. It, 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 it denies funding to groups that not, it not only defines, denies funding, American government public funding to groups that um, work in with contraception, with population um, control in a form of rights for women and or in abortion. It also denies any kind of public funding. So this is USAID funding um, to groups that anywhere in their operations provide counseling on reproductive rights and reproductive health care for women. So it's broader even than what had been posed by Reagan and George W. Bush before them. Mm -hmm. And people inside the feminists working inside the United Nations, inside the UN um, uh, organizations, um, and all the women's rights groups that are very active um, around the United Nations, for instance, peacewomen.com, .org, sorry, peacewomen.org, which is really important. It's the UN branch of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, peacewomen.org, but also Kavina Dil Kavina, which is the Swedish feminist um, uh, support group, and many other groups like that. They are now working inside the United Nations to try and 
find other ways to get around the global gag rules, mm -hmm. disastrous implication for healthcare providers in um, the global south. And one of the things they're doing, and this your viewers and readers can try to follow now, the Dutch government has come forward to propose a Dutch-initiated fund. Um, and there are many governments that are now saying that they will contribute to that fund. Um, the Canadian government under Justin Trudeau, which most certainly is not a regime, it's a government, um, the, under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, has said that they will contribute to the Dutch uh, government's fund. So watch what's happening in Dutch politics in order to understand the implications for women of the Donald Trump global gag rule. Well, let me give you an example of a wonderful teacher, um, Gazal Zukfer, who's teaching in um, uh, Lahore, Pakistan. And Ghazal is a PhD and she teaches women in public policy at a very elite Pakistan um, managerial, a school of management, LUMS. So Ghazal, um, who's very um, skilled in analyzing microfinance and women in, and development, became very interested in, this is about teaching, this is about really the best kind of feminist teaching, um, which excites your students, engages your students, surprises your students, and surprises yourself. You know, the best teacher is always surprised, <laughs> is not the one that always knows it all and then excites their students. You know, you have to be excited as a, and surprised as a teacher to keep the juices going. So Ghazal, um, in Lahore, Pakistan, with these very elite Pakistani students, um, she began to think about domestic workers. And, you know, I've been investigating domestic workers the international politics domestic work. But of course, I, there's just a lot I don't know. And so Ghazal and I have been having these conversations because she's been having more conversations with the woman named Rubina, who is her domestic worker and in her own home. And she, out of those conversations, and Rubina compares bosses, as you always would, right? Just not judge for Ghazal. So she began to think, well, what's the public policy around labor rights for domestic workers here in Pakistan? There's a new international labor organization, uh, Protocol 189, which is now being becoming part of international law around the rights of domestic workers, but it's not being implemented in many places. And so she began to ask out loud with her elite management students in Lahore. So who do you think cleans the toilets here at Lums? And she, so it's the institution itself. Do you know what institution you're in? And if you don't know who cleans the toilets in your own university or your own college or your own high school, do you really know where you are? And she got her students really curious, in a, but she had to teach them how you do feminist research, which means you don't do it from the top down. You don't wield power by asking vulnerable people questions that makes them even more vulnerable, right? So there's the whole learning of feminist methodology, which is to try to subvert power inequalities in your efforts to gain knowledge. Then she got these students, because I was just fabulous. She got these students to start asking questions of the women who are cleaning the toilets of their own family's household. Then she took them to the very, very poor neighborhood of one of the poor neighborhoods of Lahore, which is one of these up and coming global cities. Lahore is a, you know, one of the really coming cities, right? But it has very poor neighborhoods as well. So they went and sat in the households with the permission ahead of time and an agreement um, to actually talk to women working as domestic workers in their own space about what their jobs are like, 
what abuses do they endure? Who's, what's a good employer? What's a bad employer? What, what's the hardest thing about their work? And her students, it was like the world had opened up to them. And I thought, well, this is feminist teaching. Then, with her students having done the research, they went and did a presentation at the Pakistan Human Rights Commission wow. as people who'd done research on the working conditions, and it's almost all women, of women who are household and institution cleaners. So they both learned, they gathered information, then they became responsible, accountable citizens and informed the Human Rights Commission, here's a whole area of human rights we in Pakistan have not thought enough about. The thing is, what other things do we not know about our own institutions? What other things do we just depend on inequalities, forms of sexism, forms of racism, forms of abuse, forms of neglect, that we just think are part of the plaster of the organizations we work with. There were a couple things for me, which is, this is the start, not the end. But to have created this march is a culmination of years of grassroots conversations, grassroots movements, and learning about intersectionality. And intersectionality sometimes is used to refer mainly to cross-race trust building, which takes years, cross-ethnicity learning about what is an issue and what are barriers to participation. And I, But I think intersectionality is, in its best sense, is something you live. And you live it by listening. You live it by figuring out why some people don't think this is their space, mm -hmm. right? So everybody who's there, that's the story. Everybody who kind of thought, oh, I'm not sure whether I should be there. Is this my public space? They're just as interesting and valuable to listen to. The other thing is, and this comes back to news coverage, there were women's marches in Belgrade. There were women's marches in Dublin. There were women's marches um, in a lot of different places that we, there was even a small one in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City, right? And so it wasn't just an American anti-Trump march. And we need to really pay attention to, well, if you're an Irish feminist, why did you go out and march that day? Is it just because the Trump presidency is worrisome to you? Or do you see the connection between the Trump presidency and this is the Irish feminist and your campaigning going on right now to repeal the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, which is the anti-abortion uh, amendment of the Constitution. And for a lot of Irish feminists, it was the combination, the awful combination of the Eighth Amendment and the Trump ascendancy. And so we shouldn't imagine that everybody who marched all over the world, and my guess is a lot of people who are listening to your magazine, um, they were in marches and they know that there were local issues the issues in Delhi are not the same as the issues in Boston. And the issues in Boston aren't the same as the issues in Mexico City. It doesn't mean they don't have a lot of overlap, but we shouldn't think overlap means identity, identical um, uh, concerns. So as you know from me, um, for many of our conversations together over the last several years, we have to be a lot more curious and that means you have to be a very energetic listener, not to be paralyzed, not to not act. That's always the balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How to be, how to think, I don't know enough. I've got to listen more. I'm probably not being inclusive enough. 
I shouldn't do anything until I've really become seriously inclusive. And you've got to weigh that against, but when will that be? And you can't use the, well, I've got to act now, even if I'm not inclusive enough, as a way to be lazy about building those intersectional trusts. It's, it's something that never goes away mm-hmm. between urgency and inclusiveness, curiosity and action. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the answer. And sometimes I'm sure I get it wrong. You know, I say, not yet. And somebody else says, oh, my God, you can't keep waiting. Or I say, oh, my God, we have to go forward. And somebody else says, yeah, but is it really really an inclusive action? Or have we not done the groundwork yet? And we'll send out the wrong message because it's too homogeneous an action. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's not a simple formula. It's a process. But feminists know that. Feminists are always talking about process. It drives other people crazy. But, you know, it allows you to be a political actor with stamina. Stamina means, I think, a stamina to hang in there when the processes have to be complicated. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I run out of stamina. Mm-hmm. But luckily other people don't. It's so important that we learn from each other and we learn from each other's movements that are happening all over the world right now, especially. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for sitting with me today and answering my questions and having this fantastic conversation. It's really heartening and um, energizing and inspiring for me to speak with you each time. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.